without community support and grants, this lecture series wouldn't be possible and free and open to everybody, so we're really grateful for that. And we also want to thank the Museum of the Rockies for all of their support for the lecture series and for the use of the Haber Auditorium. Okay, tonight I'm exceptionally pleased to have the opportunity to introduce tonight's speaker, Crystal Alegria. I have known Crystal for over a decade now, hard to believe, um, <laughs> as both a colleague and a friend. And she continually inspires me and so many around her with her dedication, her work ethic, her sense of humor, and above all, her kindness. Crystal is the co-founder and co-director of the Extreme History Project. She is also um, an employee, I don't want to say an employee, she also works for the National Office of Project Archaeology, which is housed within Montana State University's Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Crystal grew up in Livingston, Montana, and received her BS in Anthropology and her MA in History both from Montana State University here in Bozeman. After receiving her MA, she moved to San Diego and applied her new knowledge to the La Jolla, is that right? Yeah. It's not Jola, right? Okay, La Jolla <laughs> Historical Society. My little bit of Spanish helping me there. After that, she was hired as the Assistant Curator of Historical Services for the Wells Fargo History Museum, also in San Diego, where she specialized in exhibit research, design, and development. The mountains eventually called her back to Montana, and in 2004, she returned to Bozeman and joined the Project Archaeology team. In 2010, Crystal was instrumental in creating the Montana Archaeological Site Stewardship Program, and in 2012, she went on to co-found the Extreme History Project. Crystal has a love for all things historic, and has a passion for engaging the public with the past. She's developed walking tours for the Extreme History Project, including the Family Matters, Bozeman's Historic African American Community Walking Tour that debuted in 2015. She also has a love for places where cultures come together and has been working on the history of the first pro-Indian agency with colleague Marsha Fulton for the past six years. Together, they recently published an article in the Montana Magazine of Western History entitled Fraud at Fort Parker, How Corruption and Contracting Built Early Bozeman. Crystal received the 2015 Montana Historic Preservation Award for Outstanding Preservation and Outreach for her work with Project Archaeology. And alongside Marsha Fulton, she received the Montana Preservation Alliance's Historic Preservation Excellence Award for an Outstanding Tribal Preservation Project for their work documenting the history of Fort Parker. And with that, please help me welcome tonight's speaker, Crystal Allen. Sunset Hill Cemetery in 
volunteering one wintry afternoon, I saw Lizzie's very decorative marble headstone that you see here. And the date on it, 1875, really drew me in. She lived in Bozeman in the early days when the streets were, were dirt, no pavement yet, and the buildings were all wood frame with just a few brick buildings on Main Street. I wondered who this lady might have been, what her life might have been like here in early Bozeman. And I immediately went home and started researching Lizzie, starting with census records, because that's always the place to start. So um, I found her quickly listed in Bozeman's 1870 census record. And to my surprise, I re realized that she was listed as M for mulatto, which meant she was probably of African-American descent since she was born in Kentucky. She had no husband listed as living with her. She had no children listed as living with her in 1870, and no other obvious relations in Bozeman. She was 33 years old and listed as keeping restaurant. So this just really blew me away. I couldn't believe that there was an African-American woman living in Bozeman in 1870 with no husband running a restaurant. Very unusual for the time. So as I delved deeper into the census record, I noticed that she lived right next door or possibly in the same dwelling as Samuel Lewis, a man who lived here in Bozeman and worked here in Bozeman as a barber and was also listed as mulatto. So were they friends? Were they business partners? Were they more than that? All these questions bubbled to the surface, so I continued to research Lizzie sporadically over the years. As I worked on other projects, I would run across Lizzie's name in a newspaper, I would run across her name in a ledger book, and kind of just little bits and pieces here and there. And so I just kind of, I just kept um, filing these away, saving them, and the information continued to build. And Lizzie became more and more real as the document sh shed light on her life in Bozeman. But before I continue with Lizzie's story, I just want to broaden our scope a little bit and give you some context for the time period we're talking about tonight, kind of that eight, late 1860s, early 1870s time frame. This was a time of reconstruction in our country. The Civil War had just ended in 1865. The 13th Amendment passed in 1865 as well, formally abolished slavery in the United States. The 15th Amendment, giving African-American men the right to vote, was passed in March of 1870. Ulysses S. Grant was president here in the West. Montana was uh, just a territory at that time. Gold had been discovered here in 1862 in Bannock, in 1863 in Virginia City, and 1864 in Helena, bringing a large number of people into the area. By the 1870s, the gold rush was starting to become old business, um, so people who were going to go left and those who were going to stay started to settle in, which was very problematic for the indigenous people who had been living here for thousands of years. Bozeman was established in 1864, so by 1870 it was growing and becoming a very well established, established town. Fort Parker, the first pro-Indian agency, was established in 1869, just 30 miles east of here, 10 miles east of present-day present Livingston, but in those days, in 1870, 1869, um, Livingston didn't exist yet. In 1875, the Federal Indian Bureau issued a proclamation stating that any, any Indian people found off their reservations as of January 31st, 1876, were considered hostile, setting the stage for the Battle of the Little Bighorn that happened in June of that year. So that kind of gives you an overview of where we're at historically, kind of sets you in place on what was happening throughout our nation at that time. So demographically, the population of Montana in 1870 was 20,595. So now, not, not very many people here in Montana, then, now the population of Montana is one million, still not a lot of people in Montana, really. Um, the total population of Bozeman in 1870 was around 396 to 425. So I put 396 up there, but Rachel Phillips and I, Rachel works at the Gallatin History Museum, and we've been going back and forth on this for a couple, a week or so, trying to figure out exactly how many people were here in 1870. And this 
number 396 to 425 is as close as we can come. <laughs> um, and that number doesn't include the soldiers at Fort Ellis. So um, today our population is about 43,000, a little over 43,000. So in 1870, the percentage of African American people in Bozeman was 2.8%, and today it is 0.05%. So our racial diversity has dramatically decreased. In 1870, 11 of those people um, that were living here, 11 of, of those 396 to 425 people, were African American. Here's a list of the 11 um, people that were living here in Bozeman during that 1870 census. So four of these 11 people were women, and I've included Lizzie in this list of four. Um, two of the people on this list were just children, so the, the African-American community was already starting to grow in 1870. I would like to say that I also lumped Samuel Lewis into this slide, um, and he was born in Haiti, just so you know, he wasn't actually born in the United States, but he was born in Haiti, but I will refer to him as African-American um, for the purposes of this um, presentation tonight. So, so let's get back to Lizzie. Um, Lizzie was born, kind of give you a little bit more background information on Lizzie Williams. Lizzie was born in Louisville, Kentucky in 1834. So quite a long time ago. Think about Louisville, Kentucky in 1834. And about all I know of her younger life is that at one point during her younger years, she worked at a, as a hospital nurse prior to coming to Montana. So um, that's about all I know about her in her growing up years. I don't know also if she grew up in slavery or not. But being from Kentucky and being African American, there is a good chance that she was a slave. In Jefferson County, Kentucky, where she was born, in 1850, there were 10,910 black slaves and 1,651 free blacks. So the odds are in favor of her growing up in slavery. So at some point in Lizzie's life, she decided to leave Kentucky and head west. She was in Colorado Territory prior to coming to Montana, so she may have been following the flow of the gold rush migration, like many other people, um, many other people were doing at that time. When I first started thinking about Lizzie's journey west, about her coming west, I thought of her as a pioneer, because that's kind of what just pops into your head when you think about people coming west. You think of that word pioneer. And I, for a while, I associated that word pioneer with her. But the more I thought about it, that word or that idea just didn't feel right to me. So I talked it over with a few folks, a few of my colleagues, um, Jill, who might be here in the audience tonight, and Nancy, and came up with the, or gave the word, instead of pioneer, I'll give you the, the definition of pioneer here, just so you kind of have an idea of it. Um, the definition of pioneer is one of the first to settle on a territory. And like I said before, there are many, many indigenous people already living here. So pioneer is not the appropriate word, nor is pioneer usually ever the appropriate word for those who migrated west during the 1800s. I thought about other words. I thought about migrant. I thought about immigrant. And so when um, Jill and Nancy and I kind of had this conversation, came up the, with the word refugee instead. The definition of refugee is one that flees um, especially a person who flees to a foreign country or power to escape danger or persecution. And that felt right. Lizzie was fleeing a country that was in turmoil, the U.S., after the Civil War, and she was fleeing a place that was dangerous to her. People leave places when they are unbearable, and Lizzie probably left Kentucky because it was unbearable for where she was living at the time. So now I talk about Lizzie as a refugee seeking sanctuary in the West, and eventually in Bozeman. Lizzie did spend some time in Colorado Territory, as I mentioned, before coming to Montana. But the first time we see her in Montana is in 1868, and we find her living in Springville. Anyone out there know where Springville is? Or where Springville was? Okay, well, it's no longer in existence, but um, it, was, um, it was a settlement that was located between present-day Townsend and Helena. Um, you can see it there right um, off the 287 um, across the road from current day Canyon Ferry. 
So um, she was in Springville operating a restaurant and a bar from 1868 to 1869. And um, here's a copy of her business license when she was operating that bar and restaurant in Springville. But Springville no longer exists. Um, my husband Larry and I and the kids took a drive out there the other day and we drove all around and there's nothing there. There's nothing left there but a cemetery that we, we couldn't find. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the cemetery on Google Earth, but heck if we could find it that day. So um, there's not much left there. There is a new housing development there, but there is not anything historic left. So Lizzie must have seen the writing on the wall and known Springville wasn't going to survive because she moved to Bozeman in the fall of 1869. And shortly thereafter, not too long, she didn't waste much time, in January of 1870, she purchased a lot and building on Main Street for $2,200. Quite a large sum, quite a large sum of money. And, um, you know, it, it makes me wonder where, where she found that money. And um, she might have um, gotten some of it working in Springville. It's probably a pretty good um, work to be operating a bar and a restaurant and a hotel in Springville. But um, she probably mortgaged some of that as well. The, the building that she purchased had been a tavern, so she reopened it as a restaurant. Uh, in March, we see a notice in the local newspaper, the Montana Pick and Plow, stating city restaurant, refitted, reopened, and refinished. Mrs. Lindsay Williams, for former proprietress of the Southern Hotel Springville, will be pleased to see all her old customers and the public generally. The table will be supplied with all the delicacies of the season and every attention shown to all patrons. So Lizzie was set up in Bozeman, running a restaurant on Main Street. But she doesn't stop there. In 1872, the Avant Courier newspaper tells us that Lizzie built a wood frame building on her lot and rented the building out to Mr. Merkel, who operated a jewelry store out of the building. So um, Lizzie was moving a group and she was uh, running a restaurant and she was renting out a, a, a store. So she was um, a real entrepreneur here in, in Bozeman. So let me just show you what Lizzie's Bozeman looked like. This is a photo from about 1872, and this is one of my favorite historic um, photographs of Bozeman. Um, this shows Main Street and the block between Bozeman Street and Black Street. Um, so um, Bozeman Street would have been kind of over here, and Black Street would have been kind of over here. So this is that this is that block right between um, Bozeman and Black. And there is one building or part of the building that is still with us. Um, today that is in this photo, and that is the Cooper Black Building. And this was the building that was built by Walter Cooper and Leander Black in 1872. So it's actually, can you guys see the pointer up there? Yeah. So it's actually this building right here um, is the Cooper Black Building. And, um, and you can see that in 1872 this building was just under construction and, uh, and it was still being built. But um, I also want you to know the notice these, all these freight trains um, on Main Street in Bozeman. Every historic photograph that you look at of historic Bozeman has these, these, wagon, these wagons full of goods going somewhere or coming into Bozeman from somewhere else. So um, I always think those are interesting to see as well. Um, I just want to, I'll, I'll kind of give you a, um, to kind of set you in place so you kind of understand where we're talking about um, using a picture from today's Bozeman. Um, you'll see that this is the Cooper Black building right here. Uh, we only have part of this building left. In 1972, the building, um, the, um, the bays on the right-hand side of the building were torn down, four of the bays were torn down to accommodate the um, national, the first national bank when it expanded to the east. So you can kind of see um, the Cooper Black building, what's left of it here, and that houses downtown antiques, that kind of places you where we are in, in Bozeman. The running company is right here. Um, I think there's a quilting store in here. And then if anyone has kids, they definitely know where the chocolate mousse is. <laughs> That's the chocolate mousse right there. Now, I want, to, want you to know that none of these buildings that are here today were here in 1872 when Lizzie was here. So this is all new construction right here. So this is what this area looked like in Lizzie's day when she was here. And so this is the um, area we're going to kind of focus on because this is the area that Lizzie owned. This is Lizzie's 
lot. And um, she bought it for as one lot in 1870 when she purchased, purchased it, but then it kind of became two lots over time. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you another photo here that kind of really zooms in on this area so you can kind of see um, the area that we're talking about. So um, Lizzie's area, Lizzie worked, and um, you can see this as a restaurant right here. And so my current theory is this was the building that Lizzie purchased and ran her restaurant out of. Um, this right here is probably the building that she built, the frame building that the jeweler, jeweler was in, Mr. Merkel. So, um, so that's kind of where Lizzie lived and where she um, had her businesses. And this was the town that she um, did her business in. But I want to come, talk, come back and talk a little bit more about Samuel Lewis because he is a big player in this story, and in Lizzie's life as well in Bozeman. So as you saw in the census record, Samuel Lewis is listed as being born in Bermuda, if you remember seeing that on the original census record, but actually he was born in Haiti in 1832. So census records are usually pretty close, but not always exact, so always have to check them. But when, it, when Samuel was a young boy, um, and he was living in Haiti, but then his family moved to New Jersey, and then they eventually moved to New York. And um, at that time, his mother died, died, so his father remarried, and they had a daughter, Edmonia Lewis, who was Samuel's half-sister. So I want you to remember that name, Edmonia, because we're gonna talk a little bit more about her as well tonight. So Samuel's father then died, as did his Edmonia's mother. So the two siblings were orphaned when they were very young. And um, after they were orphaned, they did go and live with Edmonia's mother's family, who were Ojibwe. So Samuel and Edmonia grew up in a native household, which is kind of interesting. So Samuel eventually, um, as after he grew up, he, he left for the gold fields in um, 1852, heading to California to make his riches. And he actually did pretty well in, in California. He settled in San Francisco. He worked as a barber and did some mining there. And um, he, but for some reason or another, he decided to move on from California, and he, he spent some time in Oregon, he spent some time in Idaho, and eventually he settled in Montana. And he settled, he ended up settling in Bozeman in the fall of 1868. So just a year before Lizzie came, he was actually here in Bozeman. The evidence shows that Lizzie and Samuel were, if nothing else, business partners. So we, we see them together, but we, at this point, I still don't really know what their connection was, but um, I found that on December 3rd of 1870, Lizzie sold part of her property to Samuel. So now I know they are business partners. Um, and, and the part of the property that she sold to him is this piece right here. And you can see that he built um, a barber shop there. And the way that we can tell that it's a barber shop is because you can see the barber pole kind of sticking out right there. Did you all see that? Yeah. So, so, um, so that was where Samuel Lewis had a very, very successful barber shop. And so here's another view from the opposite um, side of the street. And this was taken a little bit later. I think this flip photo was taken in the um, 1880s. But notice the freight trains are still on Main Street. The wagon trains are still there. So still hauling goods out and hauling goods in. And um, but you'll see that the 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 area that we're looking at, here's the um, Cooper Black building, kind of sets this in place. Here's what I think was probably Lizzie's um, restaurant. Here's Samuel Lewis's barber shop, and here is the building that Lizzie built to rent out to Mr. Merkel. And um, at this time, uh, Samuel had a much larger barber pole, so everyone in town knew where the barber shop was. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, um, so this is this is where Lizzie was at, um, and we know that Lizzie was part of the community. And the reason that we know that she was a part of this Bozeman community is because we have some documents that give us that evidence. So one of the documents um, that, that gives us some information about this is this um, that is from the History of Montana by Michael Leeson. And um, this was an effort that Lizzie supported, and it was called the Yellowstone Wagon Road Prospecting Expedition of 1874. 
And the Wagon Road Expedition was spearheaded by a group of Bozeman Knights to explore the possibilities of a wagon road in gold mining in eastern Montana, and also probably to engage the Sioux, which they ended up doing. Um, this is an interesting expedition, and there was probably a lot of our ulterior motives to this expedition that I won't go in here into much here tonight, but if you're interested, um, Google it, because it, it's an interesting part of Bozeman's history. But what I love about this is Lizzie is listed as the only woman giving support to this effort. Um, she's listed right down there. And, um, but she wasn't the only African-American person giving support to this effort. Samuel Lewis is also listed in that list there. And then there is, was also another man by the name of John Anderson, who's an African-American member of the Bozeman community, that also was part of this expedition and was a big part of this expedition. But I just love it that um, Lizzie's listed there with all the street name guys. She's there with um, Nelson Story, Peter Koch, uh, Leander Black, Lester Wilson, and Mrs. Lizzie Williams. So that's great. Um, and I don't know how she aided in the enterprise. I wonder if she gave um, money for it or if she aided it in any other ways. I'm not real sure how she did. But she also helped out in times of need. And so she helped the community by housing poor fund individuals. Uh, the community this time did not have a poor house or a poor farm until a little bit later in time. So they would farm people out to lodging houses to care for them. And then they would be reimbursed for their expenses. So we see Lizzie being re reimbursed for $120 for keeping Holt. And Mr. Holt had the unfortunate accident of being stabbed. <laughs> so he was convalescing, and he was um, convalescing at Lizzie's lodging house. Lizzie had a, a lodging house as well, a little bit later on. So, um, so she was keeping hold and got reimbursed for that, um, th those services. So Lizzie lived here in the town of Bozeman. She owned a chunk of property. I'm just going to put this picture up again. She owned a chunk of property right in the heart of downtown. She was engaged with the community. She had friends. Maybe some, um, some of her friends were the other African-American women in town, maybe including Mary McDonald, Mary, maybe including Fanny Woodson. Um, a lot of those women were her same age and were living here at the same time. She walked these streets to purchase goods and supplies. She shopped in these stores. She built a life for herself here in Bozeman, but her life was probably very different than Ellen Story's life, or Rosa Beale's life, or Sarah Tracy's life. I don't want to misrepresent her and her place in this community. Even though she was very independent and progressive, she was still a black woman, and this was duly noted in some documents that I came across. This is a, this is a document um, that's located in special collections at MSU, and it is the Wilson and Rich Daybook. And so this is kind of a listing of all their customers. And you'll notice that when they listed Lizzie's name, it lists Williams, Mrs. Lizzie. Right above, there's a little arrow that says colored. So it's duly noted that she is not um, like everyone else. She had to probably watch every word she said when speaking to people. She probably was highly aware of where people were from, the North or the South. She probably couldn't go into some stores. She definitely was not welcome in many houses. She probably couldn't walk on certain parts of the sidewalk. She couldn't look certain people in the eye when she spoke to them. She had to keep herself in check, making sure she acted appropriately for her caste and her station at all times. She was breaking out of a mold, but I don't want to represent her life as free of trouble, free of racism, and free of fear. She was probably often very fearful. It's impossible for me to know as a white woman living in 2017, um, to, it's impossible for me to know her fears and her concerns, but I do know that she had them. So Lizzie built this life here in Bozeman, and just to remind you, she's fairly young at this time when she's building this life here in Bozeman. She's in her late 30s to early 40s. But as she came into the year 1874, she must have known something wasn't right with her health. She was sick, and it was probably a sickness she wasn't going to recover from, because on July 14, 1874, she sat down in the presence of three witnesses and wrote her last will and testament. 
And just let me step out of the story for a minute and, um, and tell you that I've been researching Lizzie for quite a few years now, and um, off and on, in bits and pieces, whenever I get a spare moment, I would go up to the special collections and look for her. I'd go to the Gallus History Museum and search through their records for her. And about a year ago, I hit the researcher's jackpot. <laughs> I came across Liz Lizzie's last will and testament, and here it is. Pretty interesting looking, isn't it? I didn't expect it to look like that when I actually found it. Um, this is the will, so the will is the first two pages, and then the probate records or the estate records are all combined in this um, bundle. And so it is a bundle. It's a little bundle about this big that's, that they box up and, and put away. So, um, and I think they keep it in a vertical file. So I um, went to the clerk of district court office, and that's where this is um, held. Um, at the Law and Justice Center, and they were so nice because um, I um, probably sounded kind of moody going in asking for a will from 1874. Um, but they were great and they found it for me. They had to do some digging and they, um, they went down into the storage room in the deep, dark depths of the, the Law and Justice Center and they rummaged around for a while and they were able to find it and, um, and called me back and said that they had found it. So I went in and I looked at it and opened it up and it was dusty and dirty and it looked like a few pages had been dropped in the mud and <laughs> all sorts of things. But it was amazing to actually um, see it and to hold it. So um, just a little side note about, um, about the, the powerful aspect of a document, being able to hold it in your hand. Um, and, and this will is also very powerful because it was a will of a woman, an African American woman living in Bozeman in the 1870s. Um, and it's powerful that she had enough funds and enough property to warrant a will. So um, let's get let's dive into this will, and I want to just um, read you the first page. Um, I'll just read through it, and the text is written on the right so that you can read it, but the document is actually on the left. I, Elizabeth Williams, of the town of Bozeman City in the county of Gallatin, the territory of Montana do hereby make and publish this my last will and testament. First, it is my will that after my decease, my body shall be decently and properly buried. Second, my apparel shall be given away to such persons or person, such person or persons as in the judgment of my executor need it most. Third, all my property, real and personal, shall be sold by my executor in such manner as shall be deemed best by said executor in order to bring the most money. Fourth, I give and bequeath to Edmonia Lewis, the sister of Samuel Lewis, of Bozeman City aforesaid, one half of the proceeds of the paid property. So this was my first what the heck moment when I was reading this, because Lizzie is giving half of her estate to Edmonia Lewis, the half-sister of Samuel. And I talked a little bit about Edmonia earlier. Um, prior to this, I knew that Lizzie and Samuel were business partners, but after this, I thought maybe there was a much stronger connection. Um, so we'll come back to Edmonia in a bit. Um, fifth, I give and bequeath unto my beloved daughter, Rebecca Brown, the one other half of the proceeds of my said property. So this is my second what the heck moment. Lizzie has a daughter. Lizzie is a mother. She has a daughter, Rebecca Brown. Until this point, I didn't know about any of her other family. So it was so amazing to know that she had a daughter and, and um, her daughter's name. So um, it goes on to say that, um, that um, her executor, um, provided that my executor shall hear from the said Rebecca Brown within one year after the date of my death, and provided further that in, ca in case my said executor shall not bear from or have tidings of the whereabouts of my said daughter Rebecca, the said other half of the proceeds of my property shall go to and be inherited by the said Edmonia Lewis. And the said Edmonia shall become the sole legatee of this my last will and testament, save as to any apparel as aforesaid. And then six, she appoints Samuel Lewis as the executor, uh, executor of her will. So, um, so this was an amazing document to see and to pull out of that bundle. And here's the second page. And this was probably written by someone other than Lizzie herself. Probably someone wrote it all out. But she. Um, 
did sign it, and that's her signature. So it's exciting to see her signature. I don't have any photographs of her. I don't have anything else that's tangible of her. So um, to see that signature was pretty exciting. So we have two additional players in the story now. We have a daughter, Rebecca, who we find out a little bit later is married and living in St. Louis. Um, Missouri, and we also have Ammonia Lewis, who is Samuel Lewis's half sister. So I've already told you a little bit about Ammonia, but now I want to tell you that Ammonia was actually a world famous sculptor. Can you imagine that? Um, and because of that, we have a picture of her. And, I, and I'm, I'm going to show this picture, and then I'm also going to say that um, we also have an Ammonia scholar in the audience tonight. Elaine Tenney is here with us, and she, there she is here up there. <laughs> And um, she's done amazing work on Ammonia's history and, and Samuel Lewis's history, too. So, um, so her and I sat down for coffee last week. It was so great to talk to her about Ammonia. But um, this is a picture of Ammonia and um, a few pictures of her. And Samuel Lewis put Ammonia through Oberlin College. Oberlin is located in Ohio, where she became, became passionate about art. Her time at Oberlin was hard due to discrimination, and she ended up leaving before she graduated. But she did find someone to study under, a sculptor named Edward Brackett, who was in Boston. And she worked with Brackett until she launched her first solo exhibition in 1864. So here's an example of one of her most famous pieces, The Death of Cleopatra, which is beautiful. And it's now housed in the Smithsonian African or American Art Museum. And Monia, though, um, was famous then, but she's still famous now because just a couple weeks ago, she was the Google Doodle. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was the Google Doodle in honor of Black History Month, so it was so exciting to see that. It was amazing. Um, so I'm not certain of the relationship between Lizzie and Monia, but um, when, when, when we were talking last week over coffee, we were talking about why why did Lizzie give this um, half of her estate to Ammonia? And um, we kind of came up with the idea that maybe it was because uh, um, Samuel told Lizzie, instead of giving the money to me, I don't need it, I'm doing fine, why don't you give it to Ammonia? She's living in Rome, she's not doing so well financially, she might need the money. So that's kind of what we came up with last week. Um, um, we're going to keep working on that, though, see if we can figure it out definitively. So the, the mention of a daughter of Becca was also very enlightening. And until this point, I wasn't sure if Lizzie <coughs> had any family. So now we know she has a daughter, and most probably a husband at some point. Um, she's always listed as Mrs. Lizzie Williams. So that gives us some evidence that she was maybe married at one time. So um, we learned that her daughter was living in St. Louis. So Samuel was able to track her down, or Lizzie was able to track her down before she died. Um, I've tried to locate more information on Rebecca through census records and other documents, but I've hit dead end so far. So nothing more on Rebecca currently, but I'm still trying to track her down. Lizzie wrote this will on July 14, 1874, and her death came to pass only nine months later on April 26, 1875. Lizzie's estate records, that big bundle that you saw, takes us through the next few months as Samuel was making all the arrangements for the funeral, the payment of her outstanding debts, her property, um, disbursement of her goods, all of that. So it is through this paperwork that we learn so much more about Lizzie and the details of her everyday life. We learn, um, we also learn about the details of her death. So let's start with this document that was part of the estate invoices. And this is an invoice from a mercantile store called Strasburger and Sterling. And it lists some items that were purchased, I believe, to dress Lizzie for her funeral and her internment. And so we see on this um, one yard of crepe, and um, I have a, a, a woman that I work with, uh, Jessica, who's sitting in the front row, and she's um, an expert in historic, historic costuming. And so I asked her, asked her about this, and she said um, that this isn't enough for a dress, but crepe is often used to cut, was maybe used for decoration to cover the coffin. She also let me know that um, the one half yard illusion was fine silk net, so maybe used in her dress or in some kind of decoration. A pair of hose, kid gloves, slippers, ruching, I hope that's how you say it, ruching, ruching, okay, you guys all know this stuff. <laughs> um, 
gather trim, and so, um, so uh, ribbon, hair net. So I feel like this was maybe what was uh, what Lizzie was interred in. Um, we also have some really interesting invoices in this, and they describe and kind of outline her burial. And so we have this invoice, which was for ten dollars. And this was for um, digging a grave for Lizzie. We have this invoice from Richard Wilson that was for her marble tombstone, and it was $71.50. We have this one for um, the services at, at the funeral. Um, Lizzie attended the Methodist Episcopal Church, and so this was for the, um, Mr. Miles to do the services for $3. We have a $20 bill for um, the carriage at the funeral, and also in keeping a horse, because Lizzie owned a horse, and so I think that's the horse he was keeping. So $20 from Wakefield, George Wakefield, who is another famous Bozeman guy. Um, also $42 for the painting of, and creation or, or building of a fence that was around Lizzie's grave. And so this fence no longer exists, but whenever I go up to Lizzie's, um, Grave site today, I always think of it um, enclosed by a little white picket fence. Um, $35 for the basers for setting the monument or the headstone. We have $61.25 for the making and trimming of the coffin. So we have um, so we have all these bills that add it up to $252.72. So Funerals were expensive then, and funerals are expensive now, but um, it was an expensive funeral for Lizzie, but she had the money to cover all those expenses. So we, we also have a glimpse um, in these documents into the medications of the day and the care of the sick. So here is Lizzie's bill um, from a local pharmacy or drugstore that was operated by Mr. Morris. And this is what Lizzie had purchased on credit prior to her death. So you can kind of see that in um, 1872, um, there's a few things listed. There's some glass, fly paper, some putty. Um, in 1870, as, as you can kind of see, in 1873 here, she's got some pres a few prescriptions that she bought. In 1874, she got some cash. Um, Mr. Morris must have been the, the local ATM. Um, and, then in, and then in 1875, however, there's a lot, many, many more purchases. So there's a lot of purchases. So you can see that it starts in January of 1875 up here, and it kind of goes down, and you, there's a purchase in, in January, in February, March, there's many more purchases, and then April, which is the last month of her life, there's a purchase almost every other day. So um, it's really interesting, and I've been working with Todd Savitt, who's a medical historian, to kind of translate all this for me. And, um, and so these are his notes beside each of the things that she bought. So we see that she was buying um, in, in kind of these, um, this last year of her life, some sarsaparilla, elm bark, uh, thermometer, some cinnamon and alum. And you can kind of see um, what these things were used for um, at the time. And so when I, got, when I saw this, I got excited because I thought, well, maybe I can figure out what she died from based on this list of medications or, or um, things that she was taking. And so um, I sent this to Todd and I asked him that question. He said, well, probably not, because in the 1870s, they were not as much treating the illness as the symptoms of the illness. So these things were all treating all the symptoms that she was having. So, um, you know, there was a, and, and another thing that struck me about this list is it's kind of a, a mixture of traditional remedies. She's got strawberry tea, elm bark, cinnamon, flaxseed, with some of the newer medications of the time, like um, like citric acid and alum and camphor and, the, and these sorts of things. But um, basically, what it looks like to me on this list of items that, that she's um, that she's using is she's trying to either keep things in or push things out. So there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of laxatives, there's a lot of, um, but then there's some things that kind of keep um, bodily, bodily fluids in. So I want to do a lot more work on this. And if there's any doctors in the crowd who would be wanting to work help me with this, I would love that. I think it'd be so interesting to do some more research into this. Um, so 
Um, another part of Lizzie's um, sickness was the last days of her life and the um, and her visits from the doctor, Dr. George Monroe. And so we see that in early April or mid-April, she started having the doctor come and see her once a day, cost five dollars, which was kind of the going rate at this time for medical visits. But then on the 20th of April, she remember she died on the 26th. So on the 20th of April, he came to see her night and day. So it gives us a little peek into what was happening with Lizzie and, um, and kind of some information about how um, people were treated in those days medically. So the most interesting part, of course, of any will and testament um, and probate records is the inventory. And so this gives us a real glimpse into what Lizzie's um, household looked like when she died. And so you can see that she owned a lot. She owned that lot. She owned a house which I think was on that plot down on Main Street. Um, she also owned a horse. She had, had a lounge, some chairs. She had a very nice um, sewing machine. She had some mirrors, uh, two mirrors. She had eight photographs and frames, and gosh, what I would give to see those photos and who was in those photos. Um, she had a very nice cook stove. She had some mattresses, some pillows, bedding, blankets, um, small tables, carpets, rugs one lamp, and then she also had two finger rings, one set of sleeve buttons, and two pair of earrings, and one breast pin. So those are the real personal items that um, really speak to me on this list. So compared to our belongings today, or the things that we have in our houses, this isn't a lot of stuff, is it? Us living in this consumer age have a lot, have a lot, many more items than this, but Back in the 1870s, this was probably about what people had. Maybe not what Louisa Cosell died with, but, <laughs> but um, um, Louisa Cosell was one of our vans here in town. But, um, but this, was a, this was a good household. This was a good set of items. This was a, a good amount of things for someone living at this time, especially an African-American woman living um, in early Bozeman. So, um, so I think that this really represents that she had a good life here, a full life, with, and was able to obtain things that she needed. The total amount of Lizzie's property and cash when she died was $3,823.11. So, not a huge amount of money, but definitely um, not bad, not bad at all, not bad for an African American woman. And so I wanted to um, just show you this, this obituary. This is her last obituary. Um, and it's really long, and I didn't put it all in here, but I just wanted to give you a sense of it. And um, the one sentence that I want to read is, and through business sagacity, can you see that up there? And through, this is kind of at the top, and through business sagacity and honorable industry, she secured herself an independent livelihood in all surroundings. I love that part of the obituary. But they go on to sing her praises. They go on to talk about how kind she was. Um, she was always there in times of sickness for people, both rich and poor. Uh, they go on to talk about her, the kindness of heart, of her heart. And then they end by saying she was fully reconciled to the change, being conscious almost to the last, and assuring her friends with her last audible breath that she knew she was the heir of immortality. She leaves a daughter to mourn her loss, expected soon to arrive from St. Louis, Missouri. Peace to her ashes. Funeral from the residence of the deceased tomorrow the 28th at 2 p.m. Friends are cordially invited. So I think that um, when kind of thinking back to, thinking back to Lizzie's life and the respect that was shown in this obituary, I think there was respect shown, but I don't think we should go overboard with this and think that she was on equal footing with everyone here in Bozeman at that time. I think, um, you know, I read this and I think, oh, this community just loved her, you know, and I think they did, but I think that she was still in her place. And the reason I say that is because in Samuel Lewis's obituary, I'll read a part of his obituary. It says, it would be hard. It would be hard to find in any community a colored man enjoying the same position accorded Mr. Lewis at Bozeman. His color was never taken into consideration, except in social matters. <laughs> Even there, the old citizens have invariably done him the honor of inviting him to their homes. But 
possessed of a realizing sense of the uniqueness of this, he never attended. Hmm. So that does, it really gives us a sense of how things really were here in Bozeman. And, um, and so just to kind of finish up now and kind of wrap up our story, and um, I just wanted to tell you kind of what happened to, to Samuel Lewis. So after Lizzie died in 1875, Samuel went on to live in Bozeman until the end of his life in 1896. So that obituary was from 1896. Um, he, is, he is buried in the same general location as Lizzie. Their headstones are about 30 feet apart. Um, but Samuel did go on to marry another woman by the name of Melissa Bruce in 1883, and they had one child together. Um, here's a picture of, a, of the house that Samuel built for himself in 1881. It's beautiful, and it is so well taken care of and, and kept by Elaine Tenney and her family. It's um, on 308 South Bozeman, and um, this is probably your photograph. I got it off the, the internet, but it's probably your photograph. But, um, and, and it was placed on the National Register in 1999, which is wonderful. And, it, and um, we're so, I'm so glad that we have the research that's already been done on Edmonia and Samuel Lewis. Um, and their legacies have been preserved here in Bozeman because, because of this house and um, because of the work done. So um, Bozeman's African-American community was never as large as the African-American communities in Helena View and Great Falls, but it was an important part of Bozeman, no matter how big or small. The African-American community continued to grow right along with the city, and by 1910, there were 37 African-American people living in Bozeman, which then had a population of about 5,000 people. But by 1930, the black population was on the decline in Bozeman and through that, throughout the state generally. The factors for this are complex, but they included an increase in competition for jobs and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in Montana in the 1910s. Um, an anti-miscegenation law was passed in Montana in 1908, 1909, um, passing a law that said that African American people could not marry white people. Um, and so all these factors, and, and when laws are passed, that really represents the ideology or the ideas of a place. So um, we can see that happening. And all these factors combined to push at the African American community out of Montana to larger cities that offer better factory jobs and safety. So um, just to conclude, you know, why did I want to do this presentation on Lizzie, and why has Lizzie, Lizzie been stuck in my brain for a while? And um, I think the reason, and I know the reason I wanted to do this presentation tonight, is to shine light on the history of Bozeman's African American community and give validation and recognition to this community's history. We need to reshape Bozeman's historical narrative to include this part of the story. It's so critical. And by including the, Ameri the African American community in our own town's origin story, we can better understand our own history, our community's history, the history of our state, and the history of our nation. At this point, we really only know about the last seven years of Lizzie's life. Prior to that, she lived in a much different place with many restrictions. Some she carried with her here, and some she did not. In the West, she could be independent, and this is something we don't often see. But maybe that's only because we aren't looking. There are a few other African-American women living in Montana in the 1800s that lived similar lifestyles to Lizzie, including Sarah Bickford in Virginia City, Mary Fields in Cascade, and Nanny Kastner in Belt, Montana. So maybe there are more. We just haven't found them yet. It's time to delve into this history, not look away from it. We've been looking away from it for far too long. We've been looking away from the Reconstruction history. Because if we don't, if we don't look at it right now, um, we are doing ourselves and our communities a huge disservice. So um, how can we use and understand Lizzie's story? And how are you all in the audience tonight going to use this information presented? As a start, I encourage all of you to have a conversation with a friend or a family member when you're walking by um, the running company downtown. Say, hey, did you know this woman used to own a property that was here? Her name is Lizzie Williams. Um, but maybe bring it to the present then and talk about the importance of diverse, diversity and racial equity here in our own community. I also ask you to encourage more diversity in our community in any way that you can. 
On the way in, you were handed a half sheet page, and it has some ways to um, continue to learn about this if you're interested at all. Um, there's the website for the Montana Racial Equity Project, and Judith is here tonight, um, so you can talk to her. She's right up here at the, at the top, and so you can talk to her more about how to get involved with the Montana Racial Equity Project. There's also a wonderful website that the state of Montana has just put up on their um, State Historic Preservation Office um, website, and it's all about African American community in Montana. So you can look at that and learn a little bit more. We also have some books listed on that sheet. Um, the Warmth of Other Sons is a great book about the great migration that happened later in time. Um, a few other great, really easy, easily accessible books that are fun to read. Um, and so, um, with that, um, I would like to thank you for coming tonight. And I would, um, first and foremost, like to let Lizzie for letting me tell her story. And to everyone for their help in helping me to tell Lizzie's story. It takes a village to raise children, but boy, it takes a village to do historical research, too. <laughs> so thank you to my village. A lot of you are out here tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. 